Welcome to this lecture on blood and lymphatic physiology. This is a lecture that will be focusing majorly on the organization and functions of blood tissue, as well as organizational functions of the lymphatic tissue. For ease of delivery, I've chosen to divide this into three parts. In the first part, which we are going to handle in this particular lecture, we'll just look at the general aspects of blood tissue, and then we'll focus on the red blood cell physiology. In the second part, which will be on another lecture then, we'll focus on white blood cell physiology, but at the same time, we look at organization of the immune system. Then in the third part, we'll be looking at uh, structural organization or histological organization of lymphatic tissues as well as lymphatic organs. So welcome to this part one of the lecture series that focuses on general aspects of blood tissue as well as the physiology of red blood cells. In this lecture, we are going to look at the following. First, we are going to say the components and general functions of blood tissue. Remember, blood is a specialized connective tissue, and we're going to see why we call it specialized connective tissue. After that, we are going to look at the components and function of the plasma, which is the fluid component of blood. We'll also then look at the morphology and functions of red blood cells. We'll, at the same time, define some indices that we use to characterize red blood cells. After that, we are going to look at the concept of blood grouping and understand why person A cannot receive blood from person B and things like that. While we are still at the red blood cell, it will be important that we look at a, an important clinical aspect of red blood cells, which is anemia. So we'll define what is anemia and state the major causes of anemia. And lastly, another aspect of red blood cell and blood in general that is important to talk about is hemostasis, which is basically the mechanism that prevents blood loss. So we'll describe hemostasis and look at how it happens. Let's begin with the first agenda, which is the components and general functions of blood. In terms of components of whole blood, we can consider the whole blood to consist of two major aspects. We have the formed elements of blood. The formed elements of blood refers to the cellular components of blood. So the cells which are in the blood tissue are referred to as the formed elements of blood. Apart from that, the blood also consists of what we call plasma and plasma is the fluid component of blood. So basically blood has fluid called plasma and cells which constitute the formed elements of blood. In this image, we see more about uh, that arrangement. So in this particular first image we are seeing several formed elements as well as the fluid component. And this image tells us more about what is within the cellular components. We have the red blood cells being part of the formed elements. We also have the white blood cells being part of the formed elements and platelets are also part of the formed elements. Generally, the red blood cells are the ones responsible for transport of gases. White blood cells are important for fighting infections and the platelets are important in blood clotting. Those are the formed elements of blood. The fluid component of it is called plasma and it contains various components as we're going to see shortly. If you take whole blood and put it in a test tube like this, and then it is allowed to settle or you can centrifuge it so that uh, 
the cellular elements sediment down. And so the fluid component go up. We'll see some layering of the various components of blood. So this layering tells us much about the proportion occupied by the different components of blood. After whole blood has been centrifuged, we see three components. The most dependent zone of centrifuge blood representing regions that contain heavy components. This one here will be occupied by the red blood cells. This proportion is what we commonly call the hematocrit or the packed cell volume, PCV. And it's usually about 45% of whole blood. That may vary a bit within some physiological ranges, but generally about 45% of whole blood is occupied by the red blood cells. And so that becomes the most dense part of blood telling you that the red blood cells are the denser parts of blood. The most superficial part of that is occupied by the plasma. So that means that plasma is the least dense. The plasma occupies about 55% of whole blood. And so we remain with a very thin layer between the two, which is less than 1%, basically. This thin layer between the two is known as the Buffy coat. And the Buffy coat represents the region of whole blood that is occupied by white blood cells as well as the platelets. So in as much as they're very important, as we're going to see, they occupy a very small proportion of whole blood. White blood cells and platelets constitute the Buffy coat. So understand that general arrangement of whole blood when blood is allowed to sediment. What are the general characteristics of whole blood? Blood is usually sticky, opaque fluid. And uh, maybe once in a while, we've all tasted blood. Commonly, as a child, you know, when you cut yourself, you see some blood, and be that temptation to just put it in your tongue. Blood usually has a characteristic metallic taste. The color of blood will vary depending on whether that blood is from arterial blood or from venous blood. The blood that is from arterial origin is very rich in oxygen because it has a lot of oxyhemoglobin. And so that blood is usually scarlet red, very rich in oxygen. Blood that is from venous origin is usually dark red because uh, it contains deoxygenated hemoglobin. It contains deoxyhemoglobin. And that one is usually dark red instead of uh, scarlet red. Why do we consider blood as a specialist connective tissue? Remember generally that connective tissues have um, cells and matrix. The matrix consists of connective tissue fibers and ground substance. That's general for connective tissues. We consider blood as specialist connective tissue because the matrix of blood is fluid. Remember the other connective tissues, their matrices are actually some solid material. It's a gel with some solid fibers, the collagen and the elastic fibers. But here we see the matrix is basically fluid so that the cells are bathed in that fluid. The formed elements just are in the plasma. The other thing that makes us consider the blood as specialist connective tissue is because it lacks this normal connective tissue fibers. Uh, collagen and elastic fibers are typically not in the blood tissue. Instead, it has some other dissolved proteins which uh, may form strands, visible strands during clotting. 
but they're not collagen fibers. We call them fibrinogen and uh, they become fibrin. So these are the reasons why we consider blood as a specialized connective tissue as opposed to connective tissue proper. An adult male has about five to six liters of blood. This could be slightly less in females, but yes, about five to six liters of blood. Maybe females would be about four point something to five point something thereabouts. Whole blood accounts about 8% of your total body weight. That means that you can actually estimate the weight of a person based on the blood volume and vice versa. Therefore, you can estimate their total blood volume based on their weight using 8% as an approximate. Blood is slightly alkaline because the pH of plasma is about 7.35 to 7.45. This is basically the measurement that is usually taken in laboratory similar to the pH of the extracellular fluid. What are the general functions of blood? Blood is important for transport of substances within the body. So remember that it helps to transport oxygen from the lung to the tissues, help to transport carbon dioxide from the tissues to the lungs, help transport nutrients from the GIT to most parts of the body or from the liver to many parts of the body. It helps transport waste products from wherever they come from, either to the liver or to the skin or to the kidneys. It also helps transport hormones from endocrine glands from their secretory cells to their target organs. For example, transporting oxytocin from the pituitary gland all the way to the uterus. So transport of hormones. Other than the transport functions, blood is important in defense against infection. And there are many mechanisms that blood uses to defend against infection, as we'll see perhaps in the next lecture on this series. But to say just a little, the white blood cells which are in the blood are important in helping to fight infections through multiple mechanisms. There are some primitive cells which help to prevent infection through inflammation. The B cells, which are white blood cells, the B lymphocytes produce antibodies and that is what we call humoral immunity. Then we also have some cells called T cells. They are also lymphocytes, which fight infected cells by killing them and that is what we call cell-mediated immunity. So they help to defend against infections. Well, they may not just defend against infections only, they also defend against uh, cancer cells. Third function is that the blood is important in regulating body pH. This is because of the various buffer systems which are within the bloodstream. And I think that's well covered better in biochemistry. Blood also helps to restrict blood loss at injury sites. Now this is through the process of uh, hemostasis that we're going to explain better in this particular class towards the tail end of the lecture. Lastly, blood is important in thermoregulation because uh, the blood flow that goes to the skin varies a lot depending on body temperature and that helps to promote heat loss or to conserve heat, depending on the situation. Right, so those are the general functions of blood, and that brings me to the next agenda of uh, the components and functions of plasma. We've already mentioned that when you take whole blood and put it to a centrifuge, allow it to settle, we are going to have three layers the plasma occupying the 55% on the top part because it's lighter, red blood cells occupying the 45% below because it's heavier, and that's what we call hematocrit or packed cell volume. 
and white blood cells occupying the middle thin layer, which we call the Buffy coat, white blood cells together with platelets. Now I want to talk about this top segment of whole blood, which you call plasma. Plasma is a liquid matrix of blood tissue, constituting about 55% of whole blood. What is it that is within this plasma? Yes, there is water, and that is what forms a bigger bulk of what the plasma is. But there are also some proteins, and we'll talk shortly about the categories of proteins which are in the plasma. The other components of blood take a very small proportion, but they're still either way very important. The nutrients that we take, you know, things like glucose or amino acids, they're just circulating, vitamins and the like. Electrolytes are also there, sodium, potassium, calcium. So the, we have electrolytes there. There are hormones indeed, angiotensin to oxytocin, prolactin, adrenaline, they're circulating the body. And uh, we also have waste products as well, you no know, urea, creatinine, and the like. All these are contained within the plasma. Let's say something more about the plasma proteins, the ones that occupy 7% of the whole plasma. We have different types of plasma proteins. Now, generally, the proteins within the plasma largely come from the liver. Perhaps the exceptions would be some hormones or most hormones actually don't come from the liver. And what we call gamma globulins. Gamma globulins are produced by specific type of white blood cells, which we call plasma cells. Those are the ones that produce gamma globulins. And these gamma globulins are useful as part of antibodies. So other than gamma globulins and hormones, the other plasma proteins largely come from the liver. The most abundant of the plasma protein is albumin. Its key functions are to contribute to the osmotic pressure of blood. So this is the one that helps to pull water into the vascular system, as opposed to water being in the interstitial tissue. It contributes to osmotic pressure. Well, there are some substances that are also bound to albumin so that albumin can also transport them. Globulins are the other type. The second most abundant plasma protein is globulin. Globulins are of three varieties. We have the alpha and the beta globulins. These two types of globulins help to transport various substances within the bloodstream. So those ones are transport molecules. And those ones come from the liver. But we also have the gamma globulins, which I've already mentioned are produced by the plasma cells. There are a specific type of white blood cells. Gamma globulins form part of antibodies. So they are useful in defense against infections. Then we have fibrinogen. Fibrinogen is a soluble protein material. It is present in its soluble form, but when blood clot is forming, fibrinogen become converted to fibril. This fibrin forms some threads which are visible on a clot. So fibrinogen is a clotting factor, basically. Those are the key plasma proteins. So this table just captures basically what I've already alluded to, the three types of uh, plasma proteins and their important sources as captured in that particular column and uh, their key functions are also captured in that particular column. 
what's the difference between plasma and serum? We hear about serum many times. We also hear about plasma. Now, serum is basically plasma that does not have the clotting factors. And so we obtain serum after allowing blood to clot. If blood clots, now the fluid, when, when blood clots, it means that the clotting factors have already been utilized in that particular blood. So the fluid component that remains that is lacking the clotting factors which have already been utilized is what we are calling serum. Generally, serum is usually used for a number of uh, clinical uh, interventions and I think you learn that in your clinical years. Great, so we've talked about general functions of blood. We've also talked about um, the plasma. I want us to now focus our attention to one entity of this formed elements, and that is the red blood cells. I want us to talk about the morphology and functions of red blood cells. Let's start with the morphology of red blood cells. The image here shows us how red blood cells look like. Initially, very small, the diameter being 7.5 microns, basically. They are biconcave cells, as you can see, with the central part being very thin and the peripheral parts relatively thick. Because the central parts are thin, the amount of hemoglobin that the central part contain will be less, definitely. And so usually the central part will appear lighter. On the other hand, the edges which are thicker will appear deeply staining. And that brings us to the concept of chromosomes. Uh, There's a particular appearance that red blood cells, that normal appearance is termed as being normochromic. If the red blood cells are having their normal color, then we say that those cells are normochromic. There are some red blood cells which may be paler than normal. That means that the central pale region will be very much extended in those particular situations. Those are situations of pathology. And the term used to describe that is hypochromia. So we can describe those cells as being hypochromic. Generally, you come across that when you're describing some forms of anemias. So that those anemias that will be having hypochromic picture, and that those anemias that will be having normochromic picture. This image shows you that normal chromicity of red blood cells. The central part tends to be slightly pale compared to the peripheral part. So if this pallor extends so much up to maybe somewhere there, then you say that is hypochromia. If it's like this, then this is normal chromia. The mature red blood cells usually lack a nucleus, and they also lack the other cellular organelles. This is compared to the immature ones. The immature ones may not have completely lost their organelles or the nucleus. In the path to the formation of red blood cells, the immature forms are largely within the bone marrow so they're not released into the peripheral circulation. Those immature forms, as we can see, will be having a nucleus. But the nucleus disappears at some point. Just before maturity, the cell that is the bone marrow last is called reticulocyte. 
A reticulocyte is a red blood cell that has already lost its nucleus, but it has not completely lost the other cellular organelles. So it may be having the other cellular organelles or the fragments of those cellular organelles are still present within that cell. That is what we call the reticulocyte. Now for reticulocytes, some of the reticulocytes find themselves into the peripheral circulation, but we don't expect a lot of reticulocytes within the peripheral circulation. If we see a lot of reticulocytes in the peripheral circulation, then we know that this bone marrow is actively forming red blood cells, and that's why a lot of them are being released into the peripheral circulation. So the lifespan of reticulocytes are usually one to two days within the peripheral circulation, and maybe two to three days within the bone marrow. The red blood cells themselves, the mature red blood cells, will have lost the nucleus, as well as all the organelles. That mature red blood cell has a lifespan of about three months. Okay, we shall talk about three to four months within the peripheral circulation. 90 to 120 days. That's the lifespan of the mature red blood cell. These mature red blood cells can change their shape. They can deform as they pass through tiny capillary beds. Yes, they look like these ones, but when they percolate through tiny capillary beds, they can deform and then restore their shape once that pressure has been relieved of them. The, the major factor that contributes to the viscosity of blood, because they are heavy, that the major contributing factor to blood viscosity. That's why blood is viscous, because of red blood cells. Okay, this image shows you the line of progression towards the formation of red blood cells. And as I've already told you, the mature red blood cell will be a nucleate by concave and does not have the organelles and it is in the peripheral circulation. But just before that, we have the reticulocyte, which have already lost, has already lost the nucleus, but it, it may still have the fragments of the other organelles. This one may be found in the circulation for about one to two days. What are the key functions of red blood cells? Red blood cells are important for transportation of the respiratory gases. So they transport oxygen, but I don't want to forget that they also transport carbon dioxide. These gases are largely transported through the hemoglobin that the red blood cells contain. It is important that the gases are transported through hemoglobin. And I'm going to show you, tell you how they are transported, the mechanisms of transport of them. But why must hemoglobin be contained within the red blood cells? It is contained within the red blood cells so that it doesn't break into smaller fragments that can easily leak out through the bloodstream. You can imagine if hemoglobin was just in the plasma, it can be broken down to smaller fragments and that means that it can just leak easily through the bloodstream. Well, the other reason why it's contained within the red blood cell is so that uh, if it was just free in the plasma, you know, it may make the plasma be more viscous and so raising its osmotic pressure. So we want it to be hidden within the red blood cells. Hemoglobin is hidden within the red blood cells so that doesn't affect the viscosity and uh, osmotic pressure of blood. Now that we've mentioned that hemoglobin is contained within the red blood cell, let's talk about the structure of hemoglobin. Each hemoglobin molecule has two components, the heme part and the globin part, and that's why we call it hemoglobin. There are four heme molecules and four globin molecules within hemoglobin. The globin molecules are of two varieties. We have two alpha chains 
and two beta chains of globin. So two alpha chains and two beta chains of globin making four globin molecules and four heme molecules. This is what we see in the adult type of hemoglobin. Each heme molecule has an ion. So that is ion, that ion, that ion, that ion attached to the heme molecule. That one that looks like a plate, we can consider that to be the heme molecule. So this is the hemoglobin molecule. The normal values for hemoglobin are usually about 13 to 18 grams per 100 ml of blood in adult male. We usually just call that on the HB. The normal HB for female is about slightly lower than the one for adults. There are different uh, cutoffs that we use to define whether now someone is anemic. We'll talk about that shortly. So having talked about the structure of hemoglobin, let's now talk about the mechanism of transport of oxygen through the hemoglobin. Most of the oxygen that is carried in blood is bound to hemoglobin and that forms what you call oxyhemoglobin. We are aware from respiratory physiology that fine, not all the oxygen will be carried through hemoglobin. There's some oxygen that is dissolved within the plasma water, maybe 1.5%. There's also some oxygen that is dissolved within the cytoplasm of the red blood cells. Again, maybe another 1.5% so that 3% of oxygen is not necessarily bound to hemoglobin, but 95% of oxygen, sorry, 97% of oxygen is bound to hemoglobin. So majority of oxygen bind to hemoglobin. One molecule of oxygen usually bind easily and reversibly with the ion component of the heme molecule. So this binding and uh, forward and reverse is very easy, but it depends on the environment. In the lungs where the oxygen levels are high, usually the hemoglobin will bind with that oxygen easily. And that is why we say that loading of oxygen therefore occurs in the lungs. So the blood become loaded with oxygen. But when that blood goes to the tissues, the concentration of oxygen there is very low and uh, perhaps the concentration of carbon dioxide is high there. When the concentration of oxygen in the surrounding is low, hemoglobin easily releases that oxygen. And so it goes to the tissues. So remember the part that binds oxygen is the ion component of the heme molecule, which is in the hemoglobin. That means what? That one hemoglobin molecule can carry four molecules of oxygen. A single red blood cell usually contain about 250 million hemoglobin molecules. What does that tell us then? That uh, a single red blood cell can carry 1 billion molecules of oxygen. That's fantastic. This is because of how red blood cells are organized. They contain largely the hemoglobin molecule. They don't have a nucleus. They don't have uh, the organelles. So they're not metabolically active, they are not necessarily utilizing that oxygen much. There is enough space for the hemoglobin as well. And look at the concavity of the red blood cells, very thin, so that respiratory gases can actually diffuse freely and easily to the level that uh, 
any deepest part of the red blood cell can easily be accessed by the molecules of oxygen. So one red blood cell carries a lot of um, oxygen molecule. How about the mechanism of carbon dioxide transport? Again, from your respiratory physiology, you understand that there are three mechanisms that lead to transportation of carbon dioxide. One is that carbon dioxide binds or rather react with water to form weak carbonic acid, which dissociates into hydrogen molecules and bicarbonate. And so carbon dioxide become carried in form of bicarbonate. And that mechanism accounts for 70% of carbon dioxide transport. Then there's another 20 to 23% where basically carbon dioxide combines with the plasma proteins, combines with protein, basically bound to proteins. And those proteins include now hemoglobin here, which is taking the lion's share basically. And that's the mechanism we want to talk about. But there's that other mechanism where carbon dioxide is dissolved in plasma water. And that accounts for 7% of carbon dioxide transport dissolved in plasma water. We know that carbon dioxide is more soluble in water compared to oxygen. And that is why a greater percentage of carbon dioxide is transported in plasma as opposed to oxygen, which was just 1.5%. So based on the mechanism of uh, transportation through hemoglobin, carbon dioxide usually bind with the globin molecule. And specifically, it binds the amino acids in the amino groups, in the amino acids of the globin molecule, rather than the heme part. Remember, oxygen binds with the ion on the heme part. Carbon dioxide binds with the amino groups on the globin side of hemoglobin. What they form is called carbamino hemoglobin. The formation of carbamino hemoglobin occurs readily when the hemoglobin is in its reduced state. So basically the hemoglobin that has already lost oxygen to the tissues, that is the deoxyhemoglobin. The deoxyhemoglobin binds easily with carbon dioxide. And for that reason, the loading of carbon dioxide by blood will therefore occur at the tissue site because that will be the one where hemoglobin has just lost oxygen, so it is deoxyhemoglobin then it binds with the readily available carbon dioxide in the tissues. That is why loading therefore will occur in the tissues. And when this reaches the lungs, the state of gas is changed there, the concentration of the gas is changed there. Carbon dioxide will then be lost from the hemoglobin. And at the same time, hemoglobin will bind oxygen to become oxyhemoglobin. Now we've talked about the red blood cells containing hemoglobin, and this help in the transportation of the respiratory gases. How are these red blood cells structurally adapted to perform these functions? First, they are very tiny and by concave. That makes them have a larger surface area to volume ratio. So they have a larger surface area to volume ratio. A big part of the red blood cell is actually exposed. And that means that the gases can actually diffuse freely from those surfaces. Also, the amount of water that is contained within the red blood cell is not much. Instead, it has a high amount of hemoglobin. 
of the cytoplasm of red blood cell is actually just hemoglobin. So it has high amount of hemoglobin as opposed to the water, the intracellular water. That's an adaptation to just increase the amount of hemoglobin content, which enable it to bind as much oxygen molecules. Red blood cells also like lack the organelles such as mitochondria. Remember mitochondria usually um, generate energy in form of ATP. Now, if it lacks mitochondria, then it means that uh, it will not be utilizing the oxygen that it is carrying. Basically, the metabolism of red blood cells is low. And for that reason, it will not be utilizing the oxygen that it is carrying. And so that's also a structural adaptation. Great. Let's look at the red blood cell cycle. Let's imagine a scenario where the blood oxygen levels are low. We call that one hypoxia. In situations of hypoxia, the body senses that and initiate mechanism that will help to restore that state. And one of the responses that the body does is basically at the level of the kidney. If the levels of oxygen in the circulation are low, the kidney is stimulated to produce a hormone called erythropoietin. Erythropoietin is the hormone that stimulates the synthesis of red blood cells. So once released into the circulation, erythropoietin acts on the bone marrow. Well, of course, there'll be other things that are also important in the synthesis of red blood cells, including erythropoietin. So erythropoietin acts on the bone marrow. And the effect of erythropoietin on the bone marrow is to increase formation of red blood cells. So it will increase erythropoiesis is what we call it. And that will help to restore that state. Remember the state was hypoxia. So if you have more red blood cells, it is therefore assumed that these red blood cells are going to then carry even the little oxygen that is there and so we are going to increase the oxygen levels. That response usually not really like an immediate thing, like you can't have hypoxia right now, then all that events happen at the same time and one second later, you've raised your red blood cell count, not necessarily that way. That occurs over time. And it explains why even athletes will then try to practice in highlands where the oxygen tension is low, so that over time, their body is able to produce enough erythropoietin that increase their red blood cell count over time. It's not just a one day thing. Now, after a period of time, the red blood cells which have been formed will age. We mentioned that after 90 to 120 days, after three to four months, the red blood cells age. And the red blood cells which have been aged are usually destroyed within the spleen, within the liver, and also within the bone marrow. We call those systems the reticular endothelial system. So the reticular endothelial system refer to the organs that destroy the red blood cells. So whether they're destroyed within the liver, within the spleen, within the bone marrow, usually, usually when they're destroyed, the hemoglobin component is broken down into two. It will be broken down into the heme component as well as the globin component. The globin component of hemoglobin, remember it's just a protein chain, so that will be broken down into amino acids which are released into the circulation as part of amino acids that are circulating in the circulation. 
uh, well, those ones, you don't have to lose them. They are actually nutrients anyway. And so they can be used for any other thing in the body. Those are nutrients. How about the heme component? The heme component of hemoglobin become again broken down. The iron part is usually taken and uh, stored in the liver in form of ferritin. So that ferritin is a storage form of iron. You can check on what's the difference between ferritin and hemosiderin. But basically, iron becomes stored in the liver. The other component, the heme, is bilirubin. Bilirubin is also picked up by the liver, and bilirubin is excreted. Bilirubin will be excreted through the biliary system. This is basically passing through the bile ducts, and the common bile duct um, to pass through even the gallbladder if it needs to be stored. But basically, bilirubin is excreted through the biliary tree. So the bilirubin that is released into the biliary tree will go to the intestines. And along the GIT in the intestines, that bilirubin become broken down by bacteria to something called stachobilin. The stachobilin is bilirubin that has been broken down by bacteria in the GIT. Now, this stachobilin that has been broken down the JT, of course, will be excreted through stool. And perhaps that's one of the things that contribute to the stool color. Something else happening at the same time. Of course, there are nutrients that you are eating in the JIT, things like iron, uh, folic acid, vitamin B12. Those ones are raw materials which are usually required for synthesis of blood. So those ones from the JIT will be absorbed to the bloodstream and they'll be used for synthesis of red blood cells as well. Great. So that's basically the cycle of red blood cells. Now let's talk about uh, various indices that we use to characterize red blood cells. I want us to talk about red cell indices. There are a number of indices I want us to describe. The first one is Hb, hemoglobin commonly termed Hb. This refers to the concentration of hemoglobin in the whole blood. We measure it in terms of grams per 100 ml of blood or grams per deciliter of blood. Hematocrit is the other measure we also call this the packed cell volume, and we obtain this when whole blood is centrifuged so that we look at the proportion of uh, whole blood that is occupied by red blood cells. Remember, the red blood cells are heavy, so they sediment down. We look at the proportion of whole blood that is occupied by red blood cell. We call that the packed cell volume or hematocrit. If you are in a place where the hospital or the laboratory is unable to do hemoglobin test for one reason or another, we can still use hematocrit to estimate the HB. And in general, the HB is usually a third of the hematocrit. So if the packed cell volume is 45%, then maybe the HB is around 15%. If the packed cell volume is 30%, then expect the HB to be 10 or around there. HB is a, approximately a third of the hematocrit. 
It's not exactly, but just an estimate. Red blood cell count refers to the number of red blood cells which are contained within a specific volume of, of whole blood. Reticulocyte count refers to the number of reticulocytes which are in the peripheral circulation. Uh, we use the term index when we want to look at the percentage itself. So reticulocyte index will be the proportion of reticulocytes compared to all the red blood cells which are in the peripheral circulation. Remember reticulocytes have already lost their nucleus, but they have some fragments of organelles. So the index is a percentage, the count is an absolute number. So the table here shows you some of the values that uh, you might be wanting to know. I've given them in form of some ranges. So the normal HB for men and women, the hematocrit for men and women. Here we can just use 45%, that's still okay. The normal red blood cell count in men and women. Now let's define this one. MCV refers to the mean corpuscular volume. Mean corpuscular volume refers to the average size of a single red blood cell. The average size of a single red blood cell. We measure it in femtoliter. And it doesn't matter whether you're male or female, we expect the red blood cells to be of the same sizes. That's the normal range. If the red blood cells are smaller than this one, then we say the cells are microcytic. And if the red blood cells are larger than this one, then we say the cells are macrocytic. If they are within this range, then we say the cells are normocytic. Second parameter, the next parameter is MCH, which stands for mean corpuscular hemoglobin. We measure this in picogram. The mean corpuscular hemoglobin refers to the average amount of hemoglobin in a single red blood cell. Average amount of hemoglobin in a single red blood cell, and that is a normal amount. Lastly, we look at MCHC, which stands for mean corpuscular hemoglobin concentration. So this one tries to give us the picture of the distribution of that hemoglobin in that particular red blood cell, which means it takes care of the amount of hemoglobin and the size of the cell. So that we look at the concentration of the hemoglobin within that particular red blood cell, mean corpuscular hemoglobin concentration. If uh, that is lower than that, then that is what will give us the hypochromic picture. And if it's within the range, it's normochromic picture. If it is above that, that will be termed as hyperchromic picture. The next one is reticulocyte count. We've already defined what is reticulocyte count. So that's a normal range. But remember that uh, if you use the term index, then uh, we'll give a percentage. And the normal reticulocyte index is about 1% to 2%. Platelet count is the number of platelets within the blood. And we again look at this one per microliter of blood. So these are thousands by microliter of blood. Different laboratories will give you different uh, measurements. So this is just one. Most of the laboratories will give you from 150 to 450,000 or from 150 to 500,000 platelets by microliter of blood. The white blood cell count refers to the number of white blood cells 
within the microliter blood. Again, this is in thousands. So this shell does a normal amount. So anyway, the last two are not necessarily red cell indices. I've just put them here for the sake of completion so that next time you look at a hemogram report, a full hemogram report, you are able to still make sense out of the other findings that are usually within that full hemogram report in addition to the parameters that give us the red cell indices. Now let's explain what is blood grouping and also understand the concept of blood transfusion. Blood group is based on the presence of specific antigens on the surface of red blood cells. So red blood cells have some antigens on their cell membrane. Those antigens could be of many varieties, but uh, two of the types are the ones which are of clinical importance. There are those that we call the ABO antigens. And there are those that we call the razor's antigens. So these are the ones I want us to discuss, the ABO antigens and the razor's antigens. Let's start with the ABO antigens. The ABO antigens is based on the presence of two types of antigens. There's antigen A and antigen B. So people who have red blood cells with the A antigen are termed blood group A. And those who have uh, the B antigens on the red blood cells are termed blood group B. If your red blood cells have both antigens, then your blood group A, B. And, and if your red blood cells do not have any of the antigens, then your blood group O. So that blood grouping is based on the presence of the antigen that is in the cell membrane of your red blood cells. Now, something important to note, a person who is blood group A has antigen A in the cell membrane of his red blood cells or her red blood cells. That very person is therefore lacking the antigen B on the cell membrane of the red blood cells. We can argue that the reason they're lacking the antigen B is because the plasma of that person contain antibodies against the antigen B. And so somebody who is blood group A, their red blood cells have antigen A, but the plasma contain antibodies against the antigen B. And that will also apply to somebody who is blood group B. Their red blood cells have the antigen B, but their plasma or serum contain antibodies against the antigen A. And that is why they don't have it. Someone who is blood group AB means that uh, their red blood cells have both antigen A and antigen B. But somebody who is blood group O, the person is lacking both antigens, is we can argue that that is so because they have antibodies against both antigens. So they have antibodies against the A antigen and antibodies against the B antigen. Remember the antibodies are found within the serum or plasma, while the antigens are found within the cell membrane of the red blood cells. It is important to know how this is acquired from your parents. 
you may be blood group A because you acquired the A antigen from your mother and also from your father. And so you could be homozygous A. But you could also be blood group A because you only acquired from that A from one of the parents. You didn't get it from the other parent. You still be blood group A, but you are heterozygous A. We write that one as AO instead of AA. Similarly, if your blood group B, maybe you are homozygous B, which means both parents gave you that trait, or you are heterozygous B, which means you only obtain it from one of your parents. Your other parent didn't have that one, you didn't inherit that one. If your blood group AB, definitely you inherited A from one parent and B from the other parent. And if your blood group O, again, definitely, it means you didn't inherit any antigen from any of your parents. So these are the genotypes for the different blood groups. And this is important to note, especially when we want to go use the ABO antigens for paternity testing or um, yeah, basically genotyping. It will be important for you to understand this phenomenon before you tag somebody as uh, this is not my child, this is my child. It's important to understand that you can be heterozygous or homozygous. Now, that brings me to the concept of uh, blood transfusion. When blood is being transfused from one person, a donor, to another person, the recipient, what exactly must we look at? Well, there are many things to look at, but fundamentally, I want to look at two things. For the person who is receiving blood, the things within that person that will make this blood not be compatible are the antibodies that that person contain. So at the recipient level, we are looking at the antibodies within the serum of the recipient. But at the donor, the things that will make the blood the donor is giving not be taken are the antigens which are on the red blood cells of the donor. So for the donor blood, you focus on the antigens that is the donor is giving. At the recipient level, you look at the antibodies that the recipient contain within his or her serum. So if you understand that at the recipient level, focus on the antibodies within the serum and to the donor, focus on the antigens, then you are going to understand the concept of transmission. So somebody who is blood group A has antigen A within the bloodstream. That person can donate to somebody who is blood group A. Why? Because somebody with blood group A does not have antibodies against A. So that person can actually donate to that person. Someone who is blood group A can also donate to someone who is blood group AB. Why? Because somebody who is blood group AB, again, does not have antibodies against A. So if blood group A is the donor, the antigen is A, you have to look for a recipient that does not have antibodies against A. And that will be these two people someone is blood group A or someone is blood group AB. Similarly, if someone is blood group B, look for an individual that does not have antibodies against B. 
and that again will be blood group B as well as blood group AB. Those two do not have antibodies against the B antigen, so they can easily receive blood from B. How about someone who's blood group AB? If your blood group AB, you can only give that blood to somebody who does not have any of the antibodies. And that limits you to only this type of blood group AB as well. If your blood group O, it simply means that there are no antigens. So you're not really worried about reaction if you are to put that in simple terms. The red blood cells are unlikely to be attacked by the antibodies. So that means you can give to any of the four blood group categories. Therefore, blood group O is considered a universal donor because of that one. Blood group AB is considered a universal recipient. Why is AB a universal recipient? Because AB blood group does not have antibodies against A or antibodies against B, which means that they're unlikely to attack the red blood cells coming in. And so they can receive from any of the four. Great, I hope you've understood that concept of uh, how to figure out who can donate to who in terms of the ABO antigens. Now let's talk about the RESA's antigens. RESA's antigens are multiple antigens. We have antigen C, antigen D, and antigen E. However, when we say someone is RESA's positive, we define that one based on the presence of antigen D. So that if you have the antigen D in the red blood cells, you are considered RESA's positive, even if you don't have C and E. And if you lack D antigen, you are considered RESA's negative, even if you have C and E. So the D antigen is the one of clinical importance. And that's the one that we base RESA's positivity on. Something quite unique compared to the ABO antigen, someone who is RESA's positive definitely does not have the antibodies against the D antigen. That one is straightforward. However, someone who is raised as negative, someone who does not have the D antigen, that person does not necessarily have the antibodies against D. You see, in the ABO antigen, if you lack an antigen, then definitely you have the antibody against it. In the raised antigens, if you lack the D antigen, you do not necessarily have the antibody against D. However, that person can be sensitized to develop the antibodies against the D antigen. Anybody who is raised as negative can be sensitized to develop antibodies against the D antigen. Now that becomes important if you're going to understand the mechanisms of, uh, of uh, raised incompatibility during pregnancy. If a woman is raised negative and they are carrying a baby who is raised negative, you don't expect trouble because they both don't have the D antigens. If a woman is raised positive and they are carrying a baby who is raised negative, again, you don't expect much trouble there so much. How about if a woman is raised negative and they're carrying a baby who is raised positive? There'll be trouble there. What's the trouble? This woman who is raised negative may be sensitized to develop antibodies against the D antigen. If indeed she develops the antibodies against the D antigen during pregnancy, 
those antibodies can cross the placenta and attack the red blood cells of the fetus who is raised as positive. And so the red blood cells of the fetus are going to undergo breakdown hemolysis. It's going to give you hemolytic disease of the newborn. So, so that is why if you are raised as negative and you're carrying a pregnancy raised as positive, it becomes a, a critical pregnancy. That does not mean that it should never, not quite the point. The point here is that that pregnancy needs to be followed closely because we have drugs that now manage razor's incompatibility quite well. So you just need to be followed up closely and be told what to do. There are some tests that you'll be sent to do to test to find out whether you've been sensitized. The point here is that usually in the first pregnancy, the woman may not have been sensitized. And so that first pregnancy will be relatively calm. If um, a woman is razor's negative and they're carrying a razor's positive child, first pregnancy, this woman has never been sensitized. And so she may not be having the antibodies against the B antigen during the pregnancy. And so the first pregnancy will go calm. But we know that around the time of delivery, there could be some mixing of blood. And that is the one that is going to cause sensitization. So that at the time of delivery or around the time of delivery, the woman may be sensitized. If this woman is sensitized, she'll develop antibodies against the B antigen. Now think about the subsequent pregnancy, what happens? In the subsequent pregnancy, if this woman already has the antibodies against B and she carries children were raised as positive. So we use the ABO antigens as well as the raised antigens to classify somebody according to a particular blood group. For example, if you have the A antigens on the, your red blood cells and you also have the raised antigen on your red blood cells, then we say you are A positive. If you have the A antigens on your RBCs, but you lack the Rezas antigens, then you are A negative. Similarly, you can have the B positive and the B negative. You can have AB positive and AB negative. You can have O positive and you can have O negative. O negative means that uh, you don't have the Rezas antigens, neither do you have the A and the B antigens. And O positive means that uh, in as much as you don't have the A and the B antigens, you actually do have the, the D antigen. And so you are O positive. Great, having talked about that, uh, I want us to now highlight on the concept of anemia and perhaps give rise, state some of the causes of anemia. Not necessarily in detail, but just uh, something to help us understand. So we define anemia as reduction in one or more of the major red cell measurements. And the major red cell measurements are the HB, the hematocrit or the red blood cell count. So if you have a reduction in any or more of these, a reduction in HB, we'll define that as anemia, reduction in hematocrit or reduction in the red blood cell count, those parameters we talked about. This will, reduce, will lead to reduced oxygen carrying capacity of blood. And so from a clinical perspective, 
we define anemia as a reduction in the oxygen carrying capacity of blood. From a laboratory perspective, we we'll define anemia as a reduction in any of those major measurements of red blood cell. But from a clinical perspective, anemia is basically reduced oxygen carrying capacity of blood. And this usually depends on the age, the gender, even geographical location sometimes. There are some specific parameters that are checked for age, gender, and, things like, and uh, geographical location. For most societies, most laboratories, the parameter that's largely used is the HB. That's the one that is most used to define anemia. So what are the possible causes of anemia then? You may have anemia because the number of red blood cells in this person are low. So we have insufficient red blood cells. And insufficient red blood cells could be because the person bled. So they lost red blood cells. And we call that hemorrhagic anemia. The reasons for the bleeding could be multiple, but either way they bled. Maybe it was trauma or another reason why they bled. Maybe it was childbirth, things like that. Or maybe the red blood cells are not enough because they are being underproduced. There is no enough production. This could be either because there's a problem in the bone marrow. There's some disease that has affected the bone marrow, so it's not being produced. Or maybe they, there's no enough stimulus to the bone marrow. Maybe we have erythropoietin deficiency because of chronic renal failure. Sometimes the red blood cells could be few because they are being destroyed too much. And that's what we call hemolytic anemia. So hemolytic anemia is anemia due to increased destruction. The red blood cells are being destroyed prematurely. Before they are 90 to 120 days, they are destroyed. So that would be hemolytic anemia. Again, there are many causes for hemolysis. Anything that causes destruction of red blood cells, premature destruction will give you hemolytic anemia. Aplastic anemia is a term given to reduced production because of bone marrow disease. That is aplastic anemia. Okay, so those ones will be anemia because of low red blood cell count. You may also have anemia because of uh, insufficient hemoglobin content. The red blood cells are normal in number, but they don't have enough hemoglobin. We see this one often in cases of iron deficiency anemia, which will give you hypochromic microcytic anemia. We also see this one in situations of vitamin B12 deficiency. Pernicious anemia is particularly the type of anemia that people get if there is something that destroys the stomach cells that produce something called the intrinsic factor. Now, let me put it this way. For production of red blood cells, there are some things that you need. Yes, you need iron, you need vitamin B12, you need folic acid. There are many substances that you need. Vitamin B12 being one of them. The body gets vitamin B12 through diet. So when we eat the foods that we eat contain vitamin B12. For the body to absorb vitamin B12, it requires something called intrinsic factor, which is produced by the cells of the stomach, the parietal cells of the stomach. So parietal cells of the stomach produce intrinsic factor. Intrinsic factor binds with vitamin B12 
to promote its absorption in the ileum. Vitamin B12 is not being absorbed in the stomach, it's being absorbed in the ileum. But for the ileum to absorb vitamin B12, it requires that, that B12 is bound to intrinsic fact. So this is the point. If someone has a disease that destroys the parato cells, it means that uh, they cannot produce the intrinsic factor. That means that they are going to impair vitamin B12 absorption. So such a person will be deficient of vitamin B12. They'll have anemia. That type of anemia is what we call pernicious anemia. You may also have uh, anemia because there is abnormal hemoglobin. And uh, sickle cell anemia is an example of such kind of anemia where the hemoglobin that they have is not the normal hemoglobin, which we usually call HbA, hemoglobin in adults. This one have what you call HbS, the sickle hemoglobin. Okay. Now I want us to talk about the process of hemostasis following vascular injury. Hemostasis is basically the plug, the whole defense mechanism that prevents blood loss following vascular injury. So if there is vascular injury, the break in the vasculature needed to be sealed. Just the mechanism of sealing that hole so that we don't lose blood. That is hemostasis. This process is usually very fast, but again, good news, it's localized. So it will happen at the site of injury. It will not happen in many parts of the body, but at the site of injury. And this process also carefully controlled. The process of hemostasis will involve the utility of a number of factors which are usually present in the blood. We call them clotting factors. Most of these clotting factors are produced by the liver as well, but uh, we may also have other sources. Some of the factors which help in clotting are also produced by the platelets as well as the tissues which have been injured. Now, during hemostasis, there are three steps which occur in a very rapid sequence. And I want us to discuss hemostasis in light of those three steps. The first step is what we call vascular spasm. The second step is what we call primary hemostasis. Primary hemostasis involves formation of the platelet plug. And then the third step is secondary hemostasis. Secondary hemostasis involves the clotting of blood, formation of a blood clot. So let's look at these three steps one by one. Let's start with the first step, vascular spasm. If a blood vessel is damaged, either by trauma, usually the blood vessel will respond by vasoconstriction. Remember the tunica media of blood vessels contain some smooth muscles. So the smooth muscles within the tunica media of blood vessels will contract in response to injury and that will make the lumen of the blood vessel to narrow so that there's reduced blood flow to that region. The factors that trigger vasoconstriction include the following. The direct injury to the vascular smooth muscle makes it to contract. Also, the chemicals which are released by 
the endothelial cells, which have been destroyed there, as well as the platelets, which usually come at the site of injury, will also cause vasoconstriction. And uh, the local pain reflexes. You no, know, there is the injury there, and so this pain, as a mechanism of a pain reflex, there'll be vasoconstriction as well. So the aim of vasoconstriction is to just reduce the blood flow to that particular site. And this mechanism is really effective, actually, when the blood vessels are small. This can actually be already enough to prevent blood loss. It can reduce blood flow for a long period of time, actually, which allow time for the other mechanisms of hemostasis also to come into play. Vasospasm is very quick. It's an immediate thing. Second step will be formation of the platelet plug. We call this one primary hemostasis. Maybe you need to understand this first. The thing I want you to understand first is this one, that an intact blood vessel, a blood vessel that has not been injured, usually has mechanisms that prevent clotting or mechanisms that prevent platelet aggregation. There are two key chemicals that prevent platelets from attaching and so aggregating in an intact blood vessel. That is nitric oxide and prostaglandin I2, which is also called prostacycline. So these are anti-plug mechanisms. These chemicals are released by the endothelial cells of an intact blood vessel and they prevent attachment of platelets on the vascular wall. However, if there's a breach on the vascular wall, so the endothelium is damaged, it means that the underlying tissues would be exposed. If the underlying tissues are exposed, that will then trigger platelet aggregation or platelet plug formation. In particular, the tissues which are exposed to be collagen fibers. When platelets are exposed to collagen fibers, it will trigger the platelets to adhere to the site of injury. So platelets are there tenaciously or adhesively to the collagen which has been exposed by the trauma. That's what we see in C. Once platelets are there into the exposed collagen, the platelets which are there become swollen, they swell. They also form spikes, which you can see in those three that are shown there. And this make them even become stickier than they were before. Such platelets also release multiple chemical messengers. So some of the chemical messengers that they release is ADP as well as thromboxane. These chemical messengers are the ones which also continue to facilitate the process of uh, plug formation that we are going to see there functions shortly. As time goes by, there's another factor that is also released that help to stabilize the proteins which have been bound. That factor is called von Willebrand factor. The von Willebrand factor is released and this von Willebrand factor 
help to bind the platelets into the site of the plug. So basically the platelets bind to the site of the plug, the site of the break, that's where the platelets bind. And these platelets also become bridged between the collagen. Now, it means that as time goes by, the number of platelets increase. That aggregation of platelets that form there is what we call the platelet plug. That plug is able to seal off any leakage. It's able to seal off any leakage that will be passing. As you can see in this last one, we see a platelet plug that has formed and uh, von Willebrand factor has also stabilized the platelets that have aggregated there. So in the image E, we are seeing here that uh, the plug has fully formed and it has been stabilized by von Willebrand factor. So the seal has been formed and this prevents leakage of blood through that defect. This is what we're calling primary hemostasis. Something interesting. The more the platelets aggregate here, the more they'll be releasing those chemical messengers you talked about. And the more aggregation will be occurring. This is a positive feedback response. So this thing usually operates in a positive feedback response. And that is effective in preventing blood loss. Now, let's look at the chemicals which are released by the platelets. So we have serotonin as well as thromboxane A2. These two chemicals enhance spasm. Remember the first step was vascular spasm. They enhance spasm. They also enhance aggregation of platelets. We also have ADP. ADP promotes aggregation of platelets. It makes the platelet to stick to the area that they are the site of injury, and it also makes the platelets to continue releasing their contents. Then we have the platelet derived growth factor. This one stimulates fibroblasts. Remember, fibroblasts are cells, are connected tissue cells that secret um, collagen, as well as smooth muscles. And these ones are important in helping to rebuild or basically repairing. So this factor produced by platelets is in looking at the future, that this site of injury need to be repaired. This product help in initiating healing process. Usually platelets aggregation alone is not sufficient to seal larger vessels, but for small vessels, it's very efficient. And usually there are multiple breaks that occur within the vascular system that platelets usually help to seal very fast on a daily basis. These ones usually affect the smaller blood vessels. So that mechanism is very important. Otherwise, we'll be losing a lot of blood on a daily basis if platelet aggregation wasn't there. Primary hemostasis help significantly. How about if the break is so big? If the break is so big, then platelet aggregation alone cannot be enough to prevent adequate, to prevent blood loss adequately. This is because the plug is usually not that strong. It's just a loosely knit structure. 
it may require enforcement if the break is big. And that is why the third step comes to play. So let's talk about the third step. The third step is uh, coagulation or blood clotting. The clot helps to reinforce the plated plug with fibrin. This fibrin usually acts as molecular glue that holds the aggregated platelets together. The clot is a fibrin mesh and it is effective in sealing large breaks. Formation of the clot occurs within three to six minutes after vascular damage. Remember, vasospasm occurs very fast within seconds. A platelet plug formation also occurs within a few seconds. But now formation of plug, sorry, formation of blood clot takes some minutes. During that process, blood is transformed from that liquid gel by a series of clotting factors, it is converted from that liquid to a gel, you know, a gel, something semi-solid, semi-liquid. It is converted to a thick gel, which we are calling the clot. We use the clotting factors for this purpose. Most of the clotting factors, as I told you earlier, come from the liver. The liver produces most of the clotting factors, but there are other factors which also come from the platelets and others coming from the blood vessels themselves, the blood vessels which have been injured. Now, the clotting factors are named, and the purpose of this slide is not to make you cram which clotting factor is which one, but just to help you understand that there are many clotting factors. They have been named numerically according to how they were discovered. So not necessarily according to the sequence in which they react, but according to how they were discovered. Importantly, you notice that fibrinogen is factor one, and it comes from the liver. There are others which are not necessarily coming from the liver, like factor four, which is calcium ions. It's not necessarily coming from the liver. So there are many factors from factor one to factor 13. I want you to notice that uh, based on the source, there are those ones which have stars. Factor two, factor seven, factor nine, and factor 10. Those clotting factors require vitamin K for their synthesis. So that vitamin K itself is not a clotting factor here, but the presence of vitamin K is important for the synthesis of factor two, seven, nine, and 10. They are vitamin, vitamin K dependent clotting factors. Right, so let's see that in a different way. I've told you they are numbered in order from one to 13 based on the sequence of their discovery rather than the sequence of reaction. Vitamin K is required for factor two, seven, nine, and 10. There are other factors that usually just, the factors tend to circulate just in the bloodstream, apart from the tissue factor, which is derived from the tissues that has been damaged. Most of these clotting factors usually just circulate within the bloodstream in their inactive form until they're mobilized to function. And when they're mobilized to function, most of them become enzymes. They're active enzymes. And so in the reaction pathway, sometimes you'll see a factor written as uh, 
let's say 7A and 7. So when you see the 7A, the A stands for the activated form. Then the 7 is the one that is not yet activated. Remember, not all of them will be enzymes anyway. Things like uh, fibrinogen will not be an enzyme to become fibrin. And uh, calcium is definitely not an enzyme. But most of them are enzymes. And these enzymes, once activated, they activate another step. So that clotting pathway is actually a cascade of events. In this image, we are seeing a cascade of events from factor 12, 11, 9, 8 in that particular cascade. On this other side, we are seeing tissue factor and factor 7 in a cascade, and they all converge to factor 10. Then we see factor 5 being involved there, and calcium and some lipids. And we are seeing there now factor 2 being activated to thrombin. So this is now 2A. And uh, that one acts on factor one. Eventually, that gives us the fibrin clot, but uh, there'll also be factor 13 stabilizing that particular clot. So there's a cascade of events. That's what I want to pick from that particular flowchart. The process of coagulation occurs in three phases, and each phase has a specific endpoint. I want us to describe the phases of coagulation. Remember, these are the phases of the third step of hemostasis. Phase one is a pathway that leads to formation of what we call the prothrombin activator. Prothrombin activator is the end point. pathway and the extrinsic pathway. The intrinsic pathway is called so because it is dependent on the factors which are within the bloodstream itself. So the factors needed for the intrinsic pathway are within the bloodstream itself. That is called intrinsic pathway. And this intrinsic pathway is usually triggered by negatively charged surfaces. For example, platelets, collagen, even glass. That's why blood clots within um, a collection tube, because glass has negative surfaces that can actually still trigger blood to clot. Now, the intrinsic pathway to formation of blood clot has many intermediate steps. And because of that one, the intrinsic pathway is usually slower than the extrinsic pathway. You can see here, when a vessel is injured, there are tissues which are exposed fine, but look at the mechanism, the, 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 the factors which are involved there. We see factor 12 being activated, 12 activating factor 11, 11 activating factor 10, sorry, factor nine. The activation of factor nine requires other things as well, but fine. Once factor nine has been activated, now there is involvement of factor eight again there. Combination of factor nine and factor eight complex is what eventually help in the activation of factor 10 here. And eventually the activated factor 10 requires factor five, but fine, eventually we lead to the formation of the prothrombin activator when we add calcium and as well as uh, other factors involved. That pathway is very long. Compared to this extrinsic pathway, which is a shorter step. The extrinsic pathway is, ex is triggered by exposure of blood to what we call tissue factor. Tissue factor is found within the tissues underneath the damaged endothelium. So when blood become exposed to the tissue factor, it triggers clotting through the extrinsic pathway. 
So we don't expect this one to take place within a test tube, but at least it will take place within an intact blood vessel, sorry, within the intact cardiovascular system, but it won't take, the extrinsic pathway to clot will not occur within a test tube. The extrinsic pathway is usually faster because it bypasses several steps of the intrinsic pathway, just leading to formation of something that activates factor 10. Right, so that is the first phase which leads to formation of the prothrombin activator. Once the prothrombin activator has been formed, there's a phase two. Phase two is the pathway to formation of thrombin. So prothrombin, which is factor two, is activated to thrombin. So thrombin is the activated factor two. The prothrombin activator basically catalyzes the conversion of prothrombin to thrombin, which is an enzyme. So that is basically phase two. We have now formation of thrombin. After phase two now, we can talk about phase three. Phase three is the common pathway to formation of the fibrin mesh. This is what happens. The thrombin that has been formed catalyze the transformation of the soluble fibrinogen factor one into the insoluble fibrin, which is this one here. Now, remember fibrin occurs as a form of not solid. Fibrinogen is soluble, but this one is solid and it occurs in form of polymers. So what usually happen is that uh, in the presence of thrombin, fibrinogen converts into fibrin, which is insoluble. And then this fibrin chains polymerize, which means that they form long chains, they form polymers. The polymers of fibrin form long strands, which are insoluble. These fibrin strands are the ones which help to glue the platelets together. Remember, we're talking about uh, hemostasis, and so there was a platelet plug formation. The fibrin strands are the ones that help to glue the platelets that are aggregated together, it glue them together so that that clot becomes structurally stable. And so this actually forms the structure basis of a clot that the platelet plug, the aggregated platelets have now been held glued together with fibrin strands. Usually fibrin will make the liquid plasma become gel-like and that helps to tra trap many formed elements, including red blood cells, which would have just leaked through that particular break will now be trapped. And so in a clot, you have trapped red blood cells as well, even trapped white blood cells also there. This image shows you the fibrin polymers and the red blood cells which have been trapped within those fibrin polymers. This kind of hemostasis, which is secondary hemostasis, is effective in sealing large clots, large breaks, or rather, until that blood vessel is permanently repaired, which means that uh, we don't just say that the clot ends there. The blood vessel needs to initiate the mechanism of repair. And so this is important until that blood vessel is permanently repaired. Great. So as we finish on hemostasis, let's say, what are the factors that limit formation of clot? A number of things. We started with this one, that an intact blood vessel actually has mechanisms that prevent clot formation. Antithrombic substances like nitric oxide and uh, prostaglandin I2, which we call prostacycline, they prevent aggregation of platelets. 
so that as long as the blood vessel is not injured, the platelets will not attach. The other mechanism that help to prevent or limit clot formation is that the clotting factors which are there in the bloodstream are actually synthesized not in their active form, but they are inactive form. So they are not yet activated, they require activation. The activated clotting factors which are in the general bloodstream, and you know they can leak, the activated clotting factors which are in the general blood are usually removed very fast from the bloodstream because you don't want them in the general circulation. You just want them at the site of injury. So the ones that are in the general circulation are removed very fast. That's another mechanism. Now, there's also something called antithrombin. Antithrombin is also a factor within the bloodstream that usually inactivates any thrombin that is not bound to fibrin. Remember, thrombin is important in helping fibrinogen con uh, convert to fibrin. Now, if there is any thrombin that is not bound to fibrin, the antithrombin usually inactivate that thrombin. And that will apply to thrombin that is in the general circulation, basically. The thrombin that is not at the site of injury will be removed by antithrombin. There are also other chemicals that circulate within the bloodstream, like uh, protein C, which usually inhibit the clotting factors. Also, we have heparin. Heparin is produced by, by some white blood cells, like um, the basophils, they can release heparin. Heparin usually inhibits thrombin itself by enhancing the activity of antithrombin. Heparin also inhibits clotting factors, largely of the intrinsic pathway. And you know, heparin is actually even available as a drug when you want to manage people with clotting tendencies we sometimes give them heparin so that they don't clot. So these are the factors that prevent clot formation or growth. Now, once a clot has been formed, a clot is not permanent there. We would expect that once healing has occurred that that clot is also broken down. So there's a process of breaking down a clot. That is what we call fibrinolysis. Fibrinolysis usually begin two days after clot formation and may occur slowly and over several days until the clot is finally removed from the site. You can imagine if there was no fibrinolysis. It means that every time your body forms a clot, the clot will be permanently there. If that happens over time, you can imagine that the clot will definitely block blood vessels gradually. So it is a good thing that we have fibrinolytic pathway to just break down the clot that has already been formed. As much as it's a slower process and occurs, it lags behind, it is important that it is there. So there are many things that uh, activate the process of fibrinolysis. Importantly, we have something called plasminogen that help to break down a clot. But this plasminogen is usually activated by another thing which we call the tissue plasminogen activator, which is produced by endothelial cells. So endothelial cells at the site of injury produce what you call TPA, tissue plasminogen activator. There are also other factors like uh, activated factor 12, as well as thrombin, those ones also activate this thing we are calling plasminogen. Now, what is the importance of plasminogen? Plasminogen, when activated, it's, it's a protein in the bloodstream, it's a plasma protein. Once activated, it becomes plasmin. This plasmin is the one that breaks down fibrin. So you can say that plasmin is an enzyme that breaks down the clot. But for you to form the plasmin, you must activate plasminogen 
there are multiple factors that activate plasminogen. So that is the fibrinolytic pathway. Well, maybe let me show you something there. We've seen from that image that uh, when plasmin acts on the clot, there are many degradation products that we see, including what you call D-dimers. This forms the reason why sometimes we may measure the levels of D-dimers when you're suspecting that someone could be having a clotting issue, although not be have been well diagnosed. You just look at the levels of D-dimers because if you, the levels of D-dimers are high, it means that the clot is being destroyed somewhere. And that means that it was already there in the first place. All right, let's finish with the disorders of hemostasis. We know that blood clotting is one of the nature's most elegant creations, but sometimes it may actually go wrong. So that is why we have disorders of hemostasis. We can classify them into two major categories. We have thromboembolic diseases. These are diseases which result from conditions that cause undesired clot formation. You know, things like deep venous thrombosis and the like. So you have just clotting within the vascular system. You don't want them, but they're happening. Then there are those conditions where you want clot to form, but not forming. And so there is excess bleeding. So we call those unbleeding disorders. There are some situations which are very tricky where you have a combination of the two. And those are the ones we call DIC. So in DIC, we have widespread clotting as well as severe bleeding occurring at the same time. You can read more about thromboembolic disorders bleeding disorders and uh, disseminated intravascular coagulation or coagulopathy. Great. So that will be the end of that lecture on the first part where we focused on general concepts of blood. And then we've also looked at uh, the red blood cell physiology. So the next part, we'll be looking at the physiology of white blood cells, and we'll also match that with organization of the immune system. Then remember the third one will be on structural organization of lymphatic tissue and lymphoid organs. All right, thank you very much. We will stop there for this particular session.